Good morning. Welcome to the first of our Breakfast Talk interview series. I'm Jeremy Artin. Following the sudden uh, opening of borders and the end of zero COVID policies in December 2022, Michael has seen a dramatic rebound in visitation. With an economy that is heavily reliant on tourism and gaming, it is no surprise that the surge of the last three months has impacted the SAR in all aspects. In fact, the prospect of a return to happy days is on everyone's mind. Yet, while we like to compare the figures to pre-pandemic times, today's landscape is a rather different one. Junkets are said to be a thing of the past. Casino licenses have been renewed under new conditions with a significant non-gaming component but also tighter controls and restrictions over movement of capital, a desire for a diversified Macau, the emergence of a digital RMB, a whole set of new parameters that draws a very different playing field. As Macau wakes up to a new reality, we may wonder what the state of Macau and Asian gaming is. Our guest speaker today is Alida Tash. With more than 20 years' experience in the gaming industry, Alidat worked at the Venetian Las Vegas and the Venetian Macau, popularizing non-commissioned gaming Baccarat. He went on to become a senior vice president of gaming operations and strategy at City of Dreams and Studio City, holding two master's degrees in mechanical engineering from UC Santa Barbara and statistics from USC. Alidat currently works as a managing director with 28 a consultancy specializing in casinos and integrated resorts in Asia. Alidat, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. All right, so you saw that um, you, uh, so you, you and I, we, we were here in Macau before pandemic times, and then we were here through, During the through, through pandemic suffered. times. Yes. So when you, saw the, um, when, when you saw that the analyst expectations where uh, uh, that actually the results were over analyst expectations. What was your reaction? What do you think? No question that um, judging from where we were, let's say last November, you know, when it just looked like it's going to be so much longer, having three years of experience of seeing how slow it was, the zero COVID kept going on. It was absolutely a pleasant surprise to see Macau go from zero to 100 in terms of how fast it, it is shocking it almost gives a whiplash to everyone just to go from no tourists to, to way too many tourists but it's a blessing by no means uh, am i complaining about the fact that our favorite restaurants are now packed uh this is definitely a welcome breath of fresh air for macau okay very good so um we, we hear in the media again we, we we're talking about a, a different playing field and we hear a lot of terms in uh the media we, we hear um VIP, we hear uh, what mass, we hear premium direct, we hear premium mass, uh, junket. So could you explain for us uh, who are not always in the casino industry what those terms are? I'll give a very brief summary. I don't want to get too much into the nuance, but basically in Macau, the tricky part, the confusing part is VIP, which most of the places is very important person is not necessarily the case. VIP here in Macau refers to the method by which you gamble. If you come in here like you and me, we go to a casino, we buy some chips and we um, gamble and we decide to quit 10 minutes after we started or 10 hours, whenever we want to. That's standard gaming. And um, that's divided into mass, high limits and premium mass. Most people confuse premium mass with high limits Premium mass is another breed of a player. Their expectations are so high in terms of luxury, the fact that they need Michelin stars, they, the fact that they need, they are definitely the best of the best in terms of the value they provide to the integrated resorts. But they're not VIP because VIP in Macau refers to the method by which you come in. So these, these premium mass people, which are really hard to find because everybody's trying to get them because they're so valuable, they get complimentary hotel rooms, complimentary limos, complimentary food and beverage because they're so valuable. However, on the VIP side, they use something called a rolling chip, a dead chip, non-negotiable chip. These are different terminology for the fact that they get a special deal from a casino whereby the guy says, I'm a high roller. I want to go get a percentage of my potential losses. I want to get it back. And these are quite hefty. Um, at times, they demand anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of their losses. Put that in the eye of a casino. The casino makes 100 percent that they got to pay 40 percent to the government, and another 25 up to 42 percent 
to either junkets or premium direct, they're left with 17, 18% to even start paying the bills, the dealers, the camera and everything else. Now, the person who makes that demand, if it's a direct com conversation between me and a single player, that's a premium direct person. That person usually comes from Southeast Asia, says, I'm coming over here, I want a big deal, I want, I want a discount. If it happens to be a, a middleman, like a junket, would go, well, in the old days, would go to Shanghai and go and get a bunch of people and say, hey guys, I'm gonna go and make an arrangement, bring all of you guys to Macau. All you need to do is give me the money here, I'll take care of everything else. Well, that's first of all illegal because the amount of money that these guys would have received exceeded the 50,000 US per year that every Chinese person can go. So they would probably get um, 500,000, 100, a million U US or Hong Kong or whatever, which is far exceeds it. Gives it to the junket. The junket says, don't worry, I'll take care of everything. These players think, wow, what a good deal. This guy's making all our travel arrangements, our restaurant arrangements, everything. I don't even have to worry about how to get money across. That person would then come to Macau, the junket operator would just come and make a negotiation with the casino and says, I want 42% of your profits or 42% of the revenue okay. on top of the 40%. That's a junket and they are, the fact that they illegally had these underground networks of getting money across was what prompted right. this whole backlash. So, so you're talking about illegal, right? And uh, we hear also a lot about um, under the table betting and it's something that has been reproached to uh, Sun City. Um, the, the yes, yeah. that's one of the many crimes that uh, the head of Sun City or Sun City as an organization was accused of. First of all, the biggest crime they had was getting money illegally from China without registering it, without you know, getting it across, across those, uh, the, 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 those amounts. They also were, they, the, the reason the government was really upset was also the fact that they, they facilitated people doing online gaming, not necessarily in Macau, which is illegal, but in Cambodia and Philippines, other places. But one of the things they did was under the table betting, and that's an interesting uh, concept. I think a good demonstration would be, suppose you're the player. As a junket operator, I'm doing you a favor. I'm gonna go and say, Jeremy, here's $10 million. You give me the money in Shanghai and I'll have the money over here. And suppose you lose 10 million. If you lose 10 million, the casino, let's say you lose that entire 10 million, the casino would give 40%, it used to be 39, now 40% to the government. So the government gets four of the 10 million. Then the junket operator, Sun City in this user's example, would then receive another 4.2 million, 42%. The casino will receive 1.8 million or 18%, of which they have to make a they have to go and pay all the bills. The way the casino, the, the, the junket would steal money directly from the government and the casino, but more from the government, was the, the way of saying, Jeremy, instead of betting, I'm gonna give you 10 million, but I'm gonna give you $1 million in chip, whatever you won or lost, I'll multiply by 10. Okay. That way, in real life, or in, in front of the camera, over the table, you would lose a million, of which the government would get one-tenth of what it would have received, would have received 400,000, the casino would only get 180,000, and the junket would get 420,000. But then the casino would collect the nine million that was under the table, all of it tax-free. In effect- The casino or the junket? The, sorry, the junket. Okay. The junket would therefore steal 90% of what the government was entitled to. So that doesn't help the government, doesn't help the casino, so basically, it doesn't really, yeah. it's not something you want to see For the player, it here. makes no difference. For the okay. player, you're losing your 10 million. Who cares what the denomination is? But the, the, the government, through the fact that it can only get 1 million 40% of it, as opposed to 10 million 40% of it, that you're basically stealing from the government and from a casino. Okay, interesting, interesting. So can I bring you back to um, the, the status of uh, 2023? So how do you think it is shaping up like uh, do you think it's sustainable like this great start that we have seen is well we are um almost a, a month and a half slightly more than a month and a half in so far this has exceeded everyone's expectation the challenge where i see is that on the mass side great news we're seeing tons of people flocking over here far better not not quite to the 2019 levels yet but it's trending the right way the the government in Macau, the government in China, would like to see lots of small fish, small players, coming, lots and lots of people. 
it's who I'm worried about is the premium mass, the premium direct um, that are more of a question mark. The junkets, we all know, they're never going to be their former selves. The junkets accounted for about one third of Macau's total winnings, casino winnings, in 2019. We're lucky. So if, if let's say 30, 33 percent, we're lucky if one third of it ever comes back because the junkets do exist outside China. Junkets do exist in Southeast Asia, Japan, Korea. We're lucky if that 30 percent comes back to 10 percent. It's the premium mass, which is a much higher caliber player, and the premium direct that are going to have two problems. A, these guys used to come maybe 25 times a year, once, twice a month, right. easily. That person, I doubt, after three years that guy applies for a visa, of course he's going to get a visa. He came in January. I've already heard multiple instances of these players saying, well, the next time you're coming back, sir, is in May. Oh, you're not coming back until April. So are these guys going to be able to come again and again and again? So the frequency, 25 times a year, are they going to guys, I don't think the guy's going to get a visa. Now, certain provinces will. And two, how is he going to bring the money over? Right. Because the underground network, which used to work for junkets, also facilitated the flow of money. And these guys are the ones who also gamble. There are players who gamble 2 million Hong Kong a single hand. Okay, so what about non-gaming then? We, we, we've heard the government going out of his way to, to, uh, to get the, the, the concessionaires to spend 13.5 billion over the next 10 years. And so what do you think about that? And is it, how much of it is really incremental? Yeah, great, great question. So let me just finish the one thought here. So mass, grind mass, base mass, check. It's looking great. Premium mass, premium direct, so far so good, but I think the proof is in April, May, June, when we see the repeated number of people coming in, junkets are going down. So collectively, like you said, non-gaming, sorry, gaming is going to be obviously lower than 2019. The question is how much? I tend to think it's going to be 40 to 55% of what it used to be, at least for this year. Non-gaming is an interesting story. You mentioned 13 and a half billion US dollars. Correct. The question is, if you're a casino, if you're a government, and you want to go in front of the media, I can go and say, I forced these casinos, or I influenced the casinos to spend another three or four billion. Or I can go and say, well, you were going to already spend nine billion in building this, and building this arena, and building that. Why don't we lump it all together? It makes us both look good. So of that $13.5 billion of supposed commitments by the six gaming operators to spend in non-gaming, I think about two-thirds of it is already allocated projects, uh, projects that would have come online had there not even been this influence on non-gaming. And they are, no, they are legitimately non-gaming. I think about one-third of it, maybe a quarter or one-third of it, is truly incremental. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, whether or not it's going to work or not, that's the question. Do you really think somebody from Shanghai is going to go and get an airline, a more expensive airline, into Macau to go see an art piece mm -hmm. to go see um, a convention that they could see elsewhere yeah. in China. That's okay. I, I guess it's deb debatable, but then we. So what about uh, non-Chinese? You know, like the the government decided to um, actually approach the concessionaires and say that uh, if uh, we will give you a tax cut, actually if you are able to uh, attract more non-Chinese uh, visitors. Uh, that that sounds very good. Yeah. Uh, but based on what we've seen so far, um, remember, we had a major exodus of expats during the three years of mm -hmm. the pandemic. The people at the top who are more likely to be English speakers and a lot of the people at the service level who happen to reside, you know, be from Philippines with the front desk, room attendants, they also were forced to go. So my question is, with the English skills leaving Macau, I don't know how you're going to be able to service a Korean, a Japanese, uh, somebody else who doesn't speak Chinese. It's going to be a difficult challenge. And again, you have competition from elsewhere, but I have a hard time um, expecting sudden attraction of Macau, given the fact that Macau already makes most of its money from the 1.4 billion Chinese next door and the 7, billion, uh, 7 million Hong Kong next door. 
It sounds good, they'll try it, but I don't think they're going to be nearly as successful as they want. Yeah, this, the amount is so small when you go from 4% to maybe double it to 8%, but it's still... It's, it's not going to be a game changer, that's it's what you're not, saying. All right. Not. Okay, so that's, that's really about the stages now, this is about the 2023. I'd like to uh, go now beyond, like what about next year, what about beyond, all right? What about 2024 and beyond? Um, so I've got this question for you. Um, so which do you see rebounding first uh, to the 2019 level? Is it the 36 billion in uh, US dollar in uh, GGR or the 9 billions in EBITDA? And which do you see return to the 2019 levels? Okay, so we're talking 36 billion US dollars in gaming revenues. Yes. And then versus nine, nine and a half billion dollars in EBITDA, which Correct. is the, the net profit. Correct. Hands down, the net profit, the EBITDA, EBITDA. is going to happen first because um, non-gaming mm -hmm. is much higher margin business. Junkets were the worst businesses. So that 30% hole of the junkets, probably 10% of it would be filled by the junkets themselves. The other 20% will be filled by base. So think of, by, by non-junkets. So just think about it. Not only do we have to recover the 70% non-junket revenue, which is going to take a couple of years. They have to then go above and beyond to go ahead and make up the losses by the junket operators. So it's going to take a few years, probably nine, seven, eight, nine years, probably the end of the decade, if we're lucky, for the gaming revenues to match 2019 levels. However, <clears throat> for every dollar won in junket, um, sorry, for every dollar uh, in uh, mass, mm -hmm. Junket has to produce three and a half dollars right. to make up what the profit is being made. Because yep. the profit margin of a junket is 10%, whereas the same guy in the mass, 35%, 40%, depending. So I think it's a lot easier for these little fish to go ahead, who are much more profitable, who don't take this 42% commission, for these guys to be satisfied. I think that's going to be a definitely, uh, the EBITDA will come back probably two, three years. The casinos will go back let's say 2026, 2027, to the same profitability, but in terms of the actual casino revenues, that will be compensated by mass revenues, by non-gaming revenues, um, but the actual casino revenues, six, seven, eight, nine years. Okay, so mass revenues would be 2019? Uh, when, uh, I'm guessing total Macau revenues, the earliest it could happen it would be 2025, 2000, um, end of the decade for revenues and uh, end of uh, probably three or four years for EBITDA. Okay, so this 20, the 20 billion in uh, mass, the 20 billion in uh, mass revenue that we had in 2019, that's, that's, that's where. Yeah, see, that's the, the tricky part. Um, 2019, most members of the media, they go to the government site and they notice of the $36 billion. 22 billion of it. 22 billion? Yeah. But, uh, you, yeah, that's the confusing part. Because I thought it was 20 million. Yes, 20 billion. 20 billion. Okay. That's an interesting nuance. If you go to the government website, they list of the 36 billion US mm -hmm. that was lost by patrons or the casinos won in 2019, 20 billion US dollars or 160 billion roughly petakas was. Uh, coming from the mass, and 16 billion came from the VIP. Correct. But in reality, it's 22 billion for the mass and 14 billion for the VIP right. because back in 2014, when the smoking laws came into effect, and bizarrely, only the VIP were exempt, a lot of casinos got cute, got smart, and they designated premium mass areas as. VIP areas. Oh. So technically, what the government see, and again, you pay, you pay a price, you pay more for the table, but the advantage is now your premium mass patrons are able to smoke. And a lot oh, of casinos okay. took advantage of that. The good news is now with the demise of the junkets and the fact that now smoking is completely gone anywhere in gaming, that difference is shrunk. So now, so if you really went back and see what was really hap gambling, it was 14 billion VIP and 22 okay. billion mass. 
All right, I understand. Yeah. Okay, so another question: Which one of the, which one or two of the operators do you see uh, outperforming uh, the pack, and which one do you see actually lagging behind? That's actually an easy question um, because look at Galaxy already number one in multiple areas, mm -hmm. and imagine the same Galaxy with twice as many hotel rooms and a modern arena and all the other amenities coming. So just sure. imagine the big, the number one player is going to double yeah. roughly in size. That's going to be definitely a winner. The other, the second winner is Sands with 12,000, 12,500 hotel rooms already with more table games than anybody else. They don't have to do much and they have the least reliance on junkets. Whereas some casinos, some, some companies relied so much more on junkets and premium mass the, the model at Sands was pack him in and put more base. Those are the people that are much more receptive. And given their large facilities, the fact that they have five large, well, three large integrated resorts, one medium and one small one, they have more capacity to convert more spaces into non-gaming. They're mice convention. Correct. So Galaxy first, Sands China second, mm -hmm. and the laggard for the last 20 years and probably for the next 10 years is SJM. They have not updated with the times. They're still operating in the 80s and 90s. They just have not been there. They have not put the formula together properly. Sure, okay. So um, you, you touched on uh, expats and the expat exodus earlier. So simple question, will they come back? Not to the same level um, as the past. Um, first of all, are the casinos going to hire that many expats? I don't know if the demand is there. During this exodus, a lot of people were forced out for the crime of basically not being born in Macau or not having a Chinese passport. And as a result, there, there, there was a challenge. However, if based on what we saw during the pandemic with COVID-0, based on the fact that there's additional markets being opened right now, look at the Middle East, look at UAE, look at Qatar. They're getting a lot of talent from everywhere else, be it casinos, being integrated resorts, being hotel, restaurants. That's the next market that you want to go to. And the other one is, a lot of the expats I know um, were mistreated by the government immigration, by the EPIM, the way that they was handled. Um, the fact that, how is it that in University of Macau, the curriculum is taught in English, and yet you go to a government office to go and do your tax form, it's either Portuguese or Chinese. That has not been there. The signage is in English, but we have not been very welcoming, right? And again, 98%, 99% of Portuguese people speak English. But very few foreigners that are not Portuguese speaking speak Portuguese. That, these are barriers that are challenging to, to expats. Plus, again, that reputation of what went on during COVID-0. I think there's less of a, wow, brand new frontier. Some will come, but not nearly to the same level as before. Okay, so what you're saying is that there's a lot of background work to make, be made to make this place truly international and attract again, make it attractive to, to the expats. Which is precisely why if you don't have enough English-speaking expats, how are you going to service the English-speaking Japanese and Koreans sure. and all the other foreigners who are going to come? Because unfortunately, the language to speak about is either Mandarin or English. Those are the languages in the, right. the world. So okay. that's going to be a challenge. All right. So another subject now, what about um, digital R&B? Uh, how likely is it that we are going to see digital R&B in Macau and what would be the, its effect? That's been one of the rumors that's been going on, that to use the RMB and make it digital. And again, that would not happen in one shot. Right now, most of the casino, well, 95, 96, maybe 98% of all casino uh, activity is done in Hong Kong dollars. The natural progression would be for there to be more renminbi, yuan uh, gaming, um, being able to just go and take your yuan, not have to convert it to Hong Kong dollars and gamble. So first you go to more tables accepting renminbi, then you go to digital. If you go to digi digital, um, it's not going to be very good for premium mass, premium direct, because most of the players from China and Macau, 70% of the revenue comes in, maybe 75% of the revenue comes from China. Um, the government can then very easily go and say, can I get a list of all your players? Can I go and match? 
let me go and match this guy's supposed revenues in China when it comes to him declaring taxes and compare it to his gambling. It just facilitates it. It makes the, the big brother be, be able to observe a lot easier than before. Okay. So I don't think it's going to be positive for Macau. So what you're saying, so what you're saying is that it would take uh, implementation, a lot of implementation in time, but uh, it wouldn't be good news, basically. I don't think it would be very good news for casinos. It may be good news for people who want to track what how things are happening, and it facilitates the flow of money. But if most of the money, if the, I mean, the doomsday scenario would be if Macau. From now on, every single transaction at a casino has to be electronic. Okay. That gives all, that makes it much more difficult for people to be able to take large amounts of money. So goodbye premium mass, goodbye premium direct from China. Okay. Hello, but how many people are Korea and Japan are going to come from premium mass? Those are perfectly legal. That's going to be a challenge for most of Macau's casinos. Okay, sure. And so you, you speak about Japan, Korea, other places. So we've seen these casinos popping up a bit everywhere. So, um, you know, we've got Singapore, Philippines, uh, with Manila, Clark, Cebu, we've got Korea, uh, with potential jurisdictions with uh, Thailand and Japan. How much of a threat do you think they are to Macau? You know, this is all induced because, you know, Macau is somehow being punished for being so good, so successful. Had Macau not been an amazing success story, these other integrated resorts would not have rushed to go ahead and copy its model. Now, sometimes it's not, it never worked at the same level. Macau, at its peak, made $45 billion US in revenue, whereas, let's say, Philippines, the most they've ever made is four or five billion. Singapore, five billion. However, the, you keep adding more casinos, more integrated resorts are coming in Korea. Like you said, Thailand is in the horizon seven, eight years from now, maybe, maybe even sooner. Japan kind of fumbled, they should have been opened. There was even rumors of opening in 2020 before the Tokyo Olympics, remember? But eventually it's gonna happen, they're gonna be late. They will have an effect, but Macau's lead was so large when it was making 45 billion at its peak, and everybody else was making three or four billion. Yeah, it will have an effect, it will have an effect, and it may make, may assist Macau for being, upping its game, modernizing, modernizing it to be able to compete with these brand new integrated resorts popping up everywhere else. Right. So yes and no, it's good in a way for Macau to kind of wake up and say they will, for Macau to attract these foreigners, because if Singapore, everybody speaks English, if Thailand, they have an amazing service industry, and you come to Macau and there's language barrier and there's a service barrier, where there's this smile is not as natural as what you get in Thailand and Philippines, that's going to pose a problem for Macau. Sure, okay. All right, so before taking questions from the floor, I've just have a last question, a bit of a recap question. So what do you think would be Macau's worst scenario and what would be Macau's best scenario? Again, barring In the another, future, in the yeah. future, like, Barring any pandemic, barring anything major collectively that's going to affect everything else, the worst case scenario would be if the government, now that it's given these, you know, tired six gaming horses some, you know, t room to breathe, we don't know what kind of demand it's going to have. For all I know, six months from now, a year from now, they're going to go and say, I want a list of every single one of your players who have gambled so much, or could you give me the list of the top 15 or top 50 people who have been here 10 or more times? We have no way of, and again, the government can do that in the name of national security. They can invoke that as the chief executive's power. More control and less competition, and you gotta kind of give them a little bit of a free hand. If you live in a very, very black and white world where everything has to be perfectly white and perfectly black, that's going to be a, pose a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, that's most of the challenge, but I, I foresee the junkets actually um, not coming back. I mean, it's an unusual resurgence we've had. But um, yeah, I think more scrutiny by the government is going to be the challenge. Okay, and what is the Michael's best scenario? Best scenario would be to proceed without the junkets. Um, I don't think junkets are going to come back, yeah. but I think the government's going to be a lot more relaxed in terms of kind of look the other way when it comes to how the money comes over here. And mm -hmm. the premium mass and premium direct does quite well. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you very much, Adidas.
Uh, we are now going to take questions from the audience. So if everyone, anyone has a question, please raise your hand. Oh, thank you. Sorry, um, I'm preaching for my own parish. Uh, how do you see the entertainment, um, the evolution of entertainment in Macau with these big companies being obliged to have a resident show, being obliged to do non-gaming activities in entertainment? How do you see the evolution? I think of all the various segments of uh, entertainment, uh, of, of the non-gaming world, be it mice, be it museums, be it shows, I think entertainment is the one that's not been tried to the same level and effect as it did before. I think that the experience what Studio City is going to go through, having a residency, I think that's going to be positive. The question is, how much will it attract? I mean, if you do have some of these entertainments locked up in a residency, like remember Celine Dion in Las Vegas, and that was the only place you could actually see them, except a few spots here and there. I think that's an interesting... Um, um, positive. The question is, there was such a disparity between the 36 billion US dollars of gaming revenue against 3 or 4 billion in non-gaming revenue that the gap will be closed, but it's such a large gap. Um, it would definitely, I think of all the areas, mice, conventions, exhibitions have always been tried for a long time. Shows, we've had two major shows in Macau, one failed, one did not. That's great. But was it, did people really get on a plane to come over here? But I think entertainment is actually one of the positive ones. I think sports and entertainment would be some of the areas that you could go ahead and raise the needle in the non-gaming world. Another question? Yeah, we have one over there. Thank you for your talk, Alidad. Uh, one uh, question about the premium mass market with the change of the strategy, do you foresee a possibility or that casino would be merging products, the gaming and non-gaming products, and then target a different mass market for their premium mass market in the future? I'm not sure what you mean by merging non-gaming and gaming. How, how so? I mean, um, uh, for so long, the premium mass market are targeting for gaming, right? Most yeah. of them are coming. Yes, yes. So now with the change of uh, moving to the non-gaming sector with lot more investment, but, uh, uh, um, let me rephrase. How would you see would be the new premium mass market that uh, casinos would be targeting? Um, again, the, um, okay, let, me, let, let me just add one more thing I didn't mention. One of the other reasons that's going to plague premium mass is that most of those players are from mainland China yeah. and the hosts, the executives on the business development are much more scared to go into China and bring them on compared to the past. So that contributes to it. But in reference to the previous question, what attracts a premium mass is all these additional amenities that are non-gaming, Michelin stars. But we do have two or three operators that already have, Macau is one of the most Michelin star places in the world, right? So there's only so much improvement. How many more stars can you give away in such a tiny area? And they've tried for a long time. So um, I think, yeah, they have to get creative about getting more personalized um, services or amenities to attract these premium mass. But the challenge is you have to be very careful in mainland China mentioning anything associated with the casino nowadays because of what we saw way back in 2015, 16 in Australia, how, they, how the, the Australians in China, they were arrested, and the fact that the government says, say, take it easy. So I think it's going to be a big challenge to get those premium guys to come over, especially as new integrated resorts are opening up in Korea. Singapore is adding another thousand rooms. All these other places are vying for the same precious uh, and rare fish that everybody's trying to go ahead and catch. Thank you. We have another question over there. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dash, for the um, talk. It's very informative. Uh, this is James Law from Luxury Retail Industry. So uh, may I ask, okay, what is your piece of advice to the Macau government? Because now 
the uh, traveling tra policy is is very relaxed, right? You can travel easily to the places where they also have casinos. Uh, I'm not very familiar with whether like Japan or the Philippines or Saipan, whether they have um, much more development. So what do you think uh, is Macau's competitive advantage? Macau's competitive advantage is that a Chinese person feels at home because it is part of China, right? Where else are you going to go find people who speak fluent Cantonese and nearly fluent a Mandarin. This is this is where you get authentic Ch uh, Chinese food, right? Real authentic Chinese food, a cuisine that is actually favored by a lot of people coming from the north. So that's always going to be the advantage. My advice, again, I want to be humble here, but my advice would be to go ahead and if you really want to go get the non-Chinese, get more English, get more English-speaking expats, or ramp up the educational system. Unfortunately, that takes a long time, so you're going to have to borrow some, get some expats in the interim. Make it more friendly for a foreigner, because sometimes when you go to the casinos and the dealers, again, by law, the dealers are supposed to be from Macau, Macau residents. And dealers are generally not the ones with higher education, so they're not exactly more likely to be English speakers. That's a major challenge. If you really want to go and attract it, somehow allow more the common language to be spoken. And also make the, make the expats feel a little more welcome when it comes to immigration, when it comes to, you know. All right, you've got everyone giggling here. So um, any other question? We'll take one last question. Yeah, one last question. Oh. Uh, hi, Alida. So uh, actually my question is, like, what do you see the best scenario uh, in terms of the, the deep cooperation with Hengxing? As people saying that Hengxing uh, uh, could be, could provide a lot of hotel room stores and other non-gaming uh, elements to back up Macau, but uh, as the, the, the government, the deep cooperation government has been set up for like almost two years and we haven't seen any policies yet. So I would like to hear your opinion regarding that. Thanks. Actually, I'm just as curious about what the plan is for Hanshin and the Greater Bay Area and how it's going to affect it. <laughs> I mean, technically Hanshin was, 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 was advertised as a dormitory for Macau where people would go stay there and they would come to Macau. That is actually a very good plan because one of Macau misses is hotel rooms. Right? Compared to Las Vegas with 150, 155,000 hotel rooms, Macau only has four star, five star hotel rooms, probably 20 to 30,000 by the time everything gets built. That's not nearly enough. So if the government does want to go and replace these big whales and these big fish that are going to go away, you're going to have to recompensate them by having lots of little fish. I think that's very positive, but again, I am not familiar with the logistics of how to go to Hanshin, how easy is it for that person who stays over there to come across the border to pretend, potentially participate in some non-gaming and gaming activities. I'm not very familiar with that. Um, let me refresh a little bit my question. So what if in the future Hanshin become another Macau but it still adopts, um, well, there's still some legal restrictions uh, uh, compare with Macau, like uh, they still don't allow uh, gaming um, legal. So, uh, and aside from that, everything else is same as Macau. So uh, do you see there are some like positive scenarios coming up in the future? I think it will have some effect. I mean, the whole, you're talking about the, the, the potential gifting of Han Chin to Macau, as long as no gaming, no casinos are built in that area. Well, if that, that helps, that definitely helps the citizens and the residents, and it helps remove some of the barriers, for example, the housing prices. Those are going to attract more of the expats. I'm not sure, with the exception of the additional hotel rooms, we're not really missing out on land to build some of these non-gaming. There's plenty of space in a lot of these areas. Um, so I will have an incremental effect, but not not something earth-shattering. If tomorrow Hanshin becomes part of Macau, I don't think that's going to make that much of a difference because we're still reliant on the premium mass, premium direct, to go and provide a significant portion of the gaming, especially in lieu of the fact that junkets are no longer 
the same monsters that they used to be. They're much, much, much small, smaller. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So this concludes our uh, interview. Alidat, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank All you right. very much, Sharon.